My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, I'm Janice Parker, and today's leadership quote comes from Maya Angelou. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. With so much on your plate, wouldn't it be nice if ordering food for the office were easy and reliable? My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. With Easy Cater's network of over 100,000 restaurants nationwide, you'll have a huge variety of options near you for any group size, dietary need, or budget. Your food arrives on time as ordered, all supported 24-7 by Easy Cater's team of experts. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hey friends, welcome to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's episode 224 and this is your host, Jeremy Burrows. I'm excited to be speaking with Janice Parker today. Janice is at a global cryptocurrency company called Luno. And she's the executive assistant to the co-founder and CEO slash executive chairman. And we're going to learn a little bit about that as well. But I just wanted to welcome Janice to the show. And I'm very excited to to be speaking with you today. Thank you for having me. Excited to be on probably one of the best podcasts I know for EAs. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the kind words. (laughs) Uh, So what part of the world are you in? I'm in Melbourne, Australia, and it is just before 12 p.m. in the afternoon, the day after where you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always say uh, it's fun to talk to someone from the future. So, awesome. <laughs> Yes, certainly, certainly. And the future's looking bright. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself personally. Uh, do you have cats, dogs, kids, hobbies, all of the above? Yeah, of course. So live with my husband in Melbourne. Um, he's Australian as well, but we did spend almost seven years living in London. And we actually moved back in the middle of the pandemic at the end of 2020, not due to COVID, um, but that was a big, it was probably one of the reasons that we decided to move home. You know, London had changed like during the lockdowns and we were very far away from family and friends. So being settled back here now for two and a half years and we now have a five-month-old golden retriever called Murphy, who is taking up a lot of my time training him and can be quite cheeky at times, but <laughs> has kind of filled a hole we didn't realize was there. So, yeah, we're, we're loving being back in our home city. Nice, nice. Uh, and then do you – what's one of your favorite hobbies? Oh, favorite hobbies. I mean – I don't know if you can call being a foodie a, a hobby. Sure. I love going out to new restaurants and bars and cafes. And I'm always, you know, dragging my husband along to somewhere that's like on my bucket list that I have. Um, probably a bit more of a relaxed hobby is I love to read. Uh, can't say I've read too many books since the pandemic. I found my attention span decreased like a lot of people, but I do read ro- lots of blogs and articles um, and I'm slowly trying to get back into it now. And I just find it, it calms me down and takes me to another world. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's let's jump right in then. So you work at a cryptocurrency company mm-hmm. and the company is actually global, but you are working fully remote. Is that correct? I am. Yes. Yeah. So I started the role when I was in London and moved back with the role to Melbourne. Didn't actually think it was possible. It was still early days of EAs working remotely, and I think many of us didn't even think it was a possibility. Um, But when I was actually handing in my resignation to the founder, he sort of looked at me, he smiled, and he's like, no, 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 you're not resigning. Like, let's try and make this work. You're moving back to Melbourne. And, yeah, it's been two and a half years. Can't say it's always been easy with the time zones. Um, But, yeah, it's it's been a wild ride at times. Um, But we're headquartered in London. We were founded in South Africa, and we are all over the world now. Wow. So... We'll we'll get into remote work 
uh, for sure as a good chunk of this conversation, but let's, let's talk about a couple things first. First of all, crypto, Mm -hmm. what's, what's kind of your elevator pitch or, um, you know, when you're at a happy hour and you're talking with people, they say, <laughs> they say what industry do you work in? Yes. <laughs> and then they say, what the heck is crypto? What's cryptocurrency? Or I've heard a little bit about Bitcoin or whatever, but what, what's your kind of, yeah, high yeah, level elevator yeah. pitch on, on that? So whole world? with cryptocurrency, there's many forms of cryptocurrency. The main one you would have heard about is Bitcoin. That's the original one. And I think that was around 2009, 2010, that that was, created i may have the year wrong and it's meant to be a form we call like a form of digital gold so obviously it's not something that you can hold but it's something that's meant to hold value over the long term another way to describe the industry is it's meant to be a disruptor to financial services so you have like these neo banks come along and these you know money transfer companies but financial services by and large is still the same industry it has been for thousands of years And there's lots of middlemen, there's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of fees, and there's a lot of people in emerging parts of the world that can't get into the banking system or they struggle with inflation and, like I said, high fees. And cryptocurrency is meant to disrupt that space and be like an equaliser. It's meant to be decentralised where you don't have to go via a middle person, a middle bank. You can, it's peer to peer. So it's meant to make things a bit more fair and equal. Now, in reality, we're probably still a long way off from that, but there's many use cases of it, you know, through South South America and Africa and Asia where, you know, people are sort of able to kind of better their lives through using cryptocurrency. Hmm. So what what's kind of your, uh, you know, 30 second summary of what specifically is Luno or does Luno do in that industry? Yes. So we are a global platform. So you can buy and sell um, some of the major cryptocurrencies with us. You've got Bitcoin and Ethereum and USDC. That may mean something to some of your listeners. It may not. Um, You know, you can, uh, you know, we have an exchange as well. So similar to like, you know, how you can trade stocks and shares, you can do that with cryptocurrency. But a lot of people through our platform, they actually, they buy their crypto and they hold it almost like long-term investments that I have crypto and I hold on to it because I do see it as a long-term investment. Anyone who thinks they're going to make a quick buck from crypto, um, I think that ship sailed about eight or nine years ago now. So it's just seen as like another form of long-term investing. Interesting. And what's kind of the, oh, maybe a funny story or an interesting remark that someone has said to you when they find out that you're in the cryptocurrency industry? Like, is there anybody that like, oh, you're you're one of those people, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> well, I have regular conversations with my um, boxing personal trainer. He's sort of, you know, a grizzly old man kind of, he has to be sort of in his 50s, 60s. Hopefully Steve is not listening and <laughs> we'll dispute his age. <laughs> um, but he's someone who, you know, pretty much pays with cash, doesn't know anything kind of about like crypto and it's always asking me if it's, you know, are they scammers, mon- money laundering, criminals? And people think that. But if you actually dig a little deeper, there's a lot more criminal activity with cash and it can't be traced. Whereas with every cryptocurrency transaction, it can be traced on the underlying technology, which is called the blockchain. So, yes, every new industry, every new technology is going to have those who, um, you know, want to do bad things with it and take advantage of it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's actually much better for the future with tracing transactions. And, you know, if I transfer transfer you money, Jeremy, it's a lot easier to trace than what it would be a normal um, money transfer. So, yeah, it's interesting always having those conversations. People think it's a scam. And that's just, it is until the industry matures. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say, I always say it's like the early days of the internet. Think about 95, 96, maybe 97. Everyone's like, what's this internet thing? And, oh, it's a scam and, oh, it's never going to take off. That's what everyone's saying about cryptocurrency now. But let's let's circle back on this conversation in five to 10 years' time. Yeah, <laughs> It'll be very definitely. different. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a crazy world to be in. And um, I'm guessing uh, I haven't. I've personally not worked in the crypto world, but I'm very familiar with it and have followed it pretty closely uh, and done a little bit of investing myself. But it, it, to me, it seems like you mentioned even the internet craze and all that. It seems like it would be a pretty fast paced 
innovative, uh, maybe even volatile industry to work 100%. in? Do you yes. feel that every day? <laughs> it really is. And I mean, probably for a lot of your listeners, they would have heard more about cryptocurrency in the last sort of 10 to 12 months than they have in the last sort of 10 or so years. And, you know, there was a big exchange in the US that was found to be fraudulent and they collapsed. Um, and because the industry is so interconnected, a lot of the big companies are interconnected, and that's just sort of how the industry has been built up. It has a knock-on effect, a domino effect. So when one falls, it can affect all kind of people in the ecosystem around them. You know, we're backed by one of the biggest companies in the industry, Digital Currency Group, um, and you know we're we're pretty solid and you know we're we're stable. Um, but you know, there's we have competitors that have fallen down, and people have been made redundant across the industry, and. You know, and things with regulators are changing all the time and governments and that affects how we operate. So, yeah, it's, you know, you can have your to-do list, you, the projects you want to, you know, implement and you literally just throw that up in the air and it'll come down in a different order. Well, let's jump into working remotely then. So you've been working remote. Um, what's maybe your top tips for those who are also working remote or maybe want to do more remote work and want to figure out how to maybe even convince their executives to let them work from home? Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, like sort of top tips, and I'm sure everyone's heard this before, but like having boundaries is so important and it really has helped me with like that work-life balance, you know, especially because I do work across such an extreme time zone, you know, like sort of when it's 9 a.m. in in London where where, um, the founder is, you know, it's, uh, you know, 6 p.m. for me, you know, I've already had like a full day and, you know, it's, yeah, it's worth discussing those boundaries with them. And I know sometimes it can be scary, but you have to remember that, you know, they're human too. And, you know, our execs do have their own personal lives, you know, outside of work, you know, they've got families, friends, hobbies. And I think kind of us all working remotely during the pandemic has kind of, you know, brought it to the forefront, but, you know, we are humans outside of work. So to have that conversation and, you know, make sure you have those set hours, even if you're not working across an extreme time zone like I am. And I'm sure you find this the same, Jeremy, that, you know, you are you can start in the morning, you can get to sort of 2, 3 p.m. You might not have had breakfast or lunch. And then kind of your workday can bleed into your evening, your time with mm. your family, especially when you're just walking out of, I'm in a, I have my own office at home. I know some people aren't as lucky. If people are sitting at their kitchen table, you know, you really have to do that kind of close your laptop, have that physical thing, walk away or go around, you know, walk around the block. Like you need to have that, that thing that signals to you that your work day is over. Um, Another top tip for working remotely. And this is not so much about how EAs can kind of ask for it to happen. It's more what I find helpful. I think we do all get fatigued with connecting over video, but for me, it's essential. I mean, my company operates um, does video meetings by default you know, it's not a replacement for being in person together, but I, I find it does help me to maintain the partnership while working remotely. You know, obviously I, I would like to be there in person with the founder, but, you know, when we are on video, I can see his expressions, I can see his body language, we can have a laugh together. You know, that's obviously when technology is working and it just helps us maintain that partnership that we did build in person and that we can continue remotely until we spend time, you know, in person again. Hmm. That's great. So what... Is there a time when being remote or maybe you can share a story or two of a situation where not being in person made it really, really hard or or was not a good setup in that in that time or in that day? Um probably not too like many like actual concrete examples I can think of. There's definitely been times when we've had like important meetings and uh, you know, Obviously, I, you know, you know, they're with a wider team, and I'm the person that kind of <laughs> has to cop it, you know. And I'm dialing in at two, three in the morning, uh, mm. which is not fun for my work-life balance. But you know, there is give and take, like, and then I have the flexibility to kind of, you know, take the next morning or afternoon or have a longer weekend or, or whatever it is. I think sometimes what can be challenging, you know, when you are working remotely, is miscommunication, which is why I mentioned before about it's, you know, essential. I think to connect over video. But just make sure you are connecting in a regular way. And that really depends on how your exec likes to communicate. You know, maybe they like having phone calls. Maybe they want to do video calls. Maybe they want to talk on WhatsApp or Slack or whatever it is. So I obviously have my own personal communication style, but I adjust to Marcus, who I support. 
and make sure that we're connecting where he feels comfortable. And it might just be that we're chatting on WhatsApp or we're sending voice notes or emails or whatever it is. But we just need to make sure that we've got that kind of that that regular meeting cadence that we are connecting because so many times when we've had, um, you know, issues with each other and then we've spoken about, we've realised that that tone of voice that is in root of communication can be misconstrued and that just having a quick conversation kind of face-to-face, if you will, over video can solve so many misunderstandings. Yeah, it's amazing how much nonverbal communication we do and Mm. having our videos on is a good way to catch that when you're in a different country or time zone or whatever. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, I assume you enjoy working from home, working remotely. I do. I mean, I do miss having colleagues and going into the office and I'm very lucky that I got to travel back to London a few times last year and also to the US to spend time with Marcus and the team and with the EA team we have at Luno. Um, But just the, you know, I spent most of my career, I spent, you know, 12, 13, 14 years, you know, Monday to Friday, nine to five in the office. And when the pandemic hit, I'm sure many people listening will feel the same. It was like, wow, we can actually do our job at home. Like I had a random day here and there working from home, but to actually mm-hmm. do it full time and I was so much more productive. And then once I kind of got into routine, made sure that, you know, I set up those boundaries. And this was while I was still working remotely in London, same time zone as Marcus. I was like, this is amazing. I can, I actually got into exercise and it's a really good habit that I've kept ever since that I do exercise, you know, well, sometimes it might be twice a week, but more it's four or five times a week. And I was never able to be consistent with kind of looking after my own like health and well-being before being able to work from home, like getting rid of that commute. And my commute before I moved to London in London was always quite long and tiring. And not having that now is it just gives you so much more in your day to spend time with your family, do household errands, you know, just work on hobbies. And now I live um, right next to the city centre in Melbourne. So even when I do, you know, one day go into a role where I'm back in the office, the the commute is not going. I could just walk to the office. So, Hmm. um, yes. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'd really like to ask you something about your LinkedIn profile, if that's okay. Yeah, of Uh, course. Which I'll link in the in the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash two two four for those that want to reach out and say hi. Um, but in your in your profile's kind of uh subheader, uh, if you will, it says aspiring chief of staff. So tell us a little bit about uh, maybe a couple questions here. One is why are you aspiring to be a chief of staff? What's what's interesting to you about that role? And then mm-hmm. maybe maybe what you feel is the biggest difference between chief of staff and executive assistant. Yes, I'll see if we can try and answer both questions together. And I'll I'll start with saying that I had very strong views about the chief of staff role. So. I do find a lot of the time, you know, that there is a ceiling that executive assistants hit in our career where you can go no further perhaps in your company or even in your career. So it looks like, and this has been picking up speed in sort of the last five or so years, that the next step is that we step into a chief of staff role. But so many times I've seen EAs have become chief of staff and they're effectively doing what a senior EA would do. And I see senior EAs who are doing what a chief of staff does, but they don't have that title. And, you know, there's some amazing people who have transitioned into the chief of staff role that, you know, there's Anne Hyatt and there's Hallie Warner and there's, you know, there's a few here in Australia and the UK that I know of. Um, But it is a very different way of working. You know, we tend to work more in the immediate as executive assistants. And there are some of us, you know, I've definitely worked on long-term strategic projects and and planning and OKRs and that sort of thing at my company that are a chief of staff would do, but, you know, sometimes at another company, you've got a chief of staff doing that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, it's, it is a very different way of working. Chief of staffs tend to be working, you know, yes, there's most times shadowing the CEO founder. Um, mm-hmm. but a lot of times they are working for the business. Whereas us as executive assistants, we are working for that executive also for the wider business, but it's a very different way. It's a very different mindset. You know, it, it, we can be yeah in the short term as EAs, but it's more long term thinking as a chief of staff. 
Um, so I was very much of the opinion for years. I was like, no, I don't want to be a chief of staff. I think I see my career becoming like a business manager or moving into project management. But I've done sort of um, a lot of like deep thinking over the last 12 months about where my career is going. And I think I'm at a point where I love being an executive assistant, but I would also love to drop a lot of the, I call it the core parts of the role, the bread and butter. I'd love to get rid of the calendar management and the emails and the travel and the expenses and that and concentrate on more of the strategic planning project work that I've been kind of involved with the last couple of years. And that's where I was like, well, a great role for me to utilize those skills that I'm developing and to grow my experience is to move into a chief of staff role. So I am hoping to move into that role kind of in the next couple of years. I do want a bit more experience before I jump headfirst into, into that role. Um, and yeah, it's quite exciting. I do feel like now I can see longevity in my career. Whereas when I was thinking I'll be an EA for the rest of my career and there's nothing wrong with that, but I was like, I'm not sure whether, you know, I've already done it for sort of 15 years. Do I want to do it for another 15, 20 more? So this is a way that I can still retain elements that I love, but also remove parts where it's like, I've been doing this for 15 years, been there, done that. It's time for a new challenge. <laughs> nice. Well, thanks for, thanks for sharing. And that's mm-hmm. definitely uh, definitely a great goal and and uh, something to aspire to for sure. So yes, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, you, Watch so this you work, space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you work with a founder slash CEO, and what do you have any tips or thoughts on working with founders? Because I know I, I work with a founder. Um, I've worked with. Uh, CEO slash founders for, I don't know, I guess like the last 12 years straight, I think. Mm-hmm. And I love it. It's, it's a, definitely a, brings its own challenges, but I like being kind of working for the top of the top, if you will. Uh, yeah, same. <laughs> what's the, yeah, what's, what are some thoughts on your experience working with, with a founder and uh, any challenges or uh, pros and cons to that? Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, similar to you, you know, it's sort of been five and a half years and I'm working with my second founder. The first one was with a global remittance company, World Remit, um, and that founder was the most amazing person. I mean, my current founder is the most amazing people, and I'm sure the same with your founders. I think you have to be a certain kind of person, an entrepreneur, to take an idea and, and start a company and then grow it into a larger company. And the things they go through with you know, their capital fundraisers and, you know, dealing with, you know, VCs and, and, you know, competitors and then trying to hire people and build culture. And, you know, I, I think that it's quite exciting, but it's quite challenging. And I think you have to be a certain kind of person to put yourself through that and all the stress and sleepless nights. And I'm sure they're working 20 hour days. I know certainly Marcus was doing that in the early days of Luno. I joined when they were 200 people. So they were not quite a startup then. Um, I absolutely love it. Like, yes, I love kind of working for the top person, but I find, you know, I haven't actually, I'll caveat this, that I haven't actually worked for a corporate CEO just with two founder CEOs right now. And I don't, I don't know if I would ever want to move away from this, you know, especially when I move into a chief of staff, I really want to help a founder, like really scale their company and build it from the ground up. I like the fact that when you are working with founders, a lot of times they, I find they, they're more hands-on. And, you know, they're, they're more involved in the day-to-day operations of the company, which Jeremy, as you would know, sometimes that can be a negative because they get a little bit too involved in certain things right. and they should leave it to their leadership teams that they hire to run those areas. But then, you know, for example, watching the way Marcus works and, and just seeing the way his brain ticks and learning from him, like I've learned more about business working with him in the last four years than I think I ever would have learned if I'd, you know, done an MBA or something and, you know, right. just seeing like he'll just, he'll keep tweaking something with the product and he'll go to the product team and go, this is not right. The font's not right. This is not right. And then they'll keep working on it. And they're like, God, this is annoying. But then they finally see what his vision is. And they're like, no, no, this is actually what the product should look like for the customer because he's just so passionate about it and he knows like he started this company to try and solve an issue for our customers. So he wants to make sure we're putting the best thing out there. Um, it can be challenging because they they've put in blood, sweat, tears, their money, their time, their effort. That I find sometimes they don't switch off, and mm-hmm. a lot of times it's 
up to the closest people in their life, you know, might be their partners, but also their assistants and their chief of staff to obviously take some of that load off their shoulders and to help them with that, but also to try and get them to put their own boundaries in place. You know, there's so often that, you know, over the years with Marcus, I'm like, are you going to take your leave? You know, you don't need to be at the office this late, you know, make sure you spend some time with your wife, you know, don't worry about those emails. I can handle it. Like, they, I think because they built everything from the ground up from day one and then as the company grows, they still think that they have to be involved so much mm. and it's up to us to kind of guide them and say, no, you have talented people to help you run the company now. You don't need to kind of shoulder that burden by yourself. Right. Mm. Yeah, that's everything you said is spot on uh, to my experience <laughs> and I appreciate you articulating it that clearly and it's definitely a, a, a different kind of experience than maybe supporting a CEO who is not the founder or supporting VPs and, and other roles. So it, it definitely requires a different skill set and really uh, temperament, I guess, if you will. And so it does. Yeah. And it requires passion. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm so passionate about what we do at our company and the same when I was at my previous one. Um, you know, obviously the founders are always going to be much more passionate than we are, but I think because uh, I hate using the word, but I think it is a much, a much more of an intimate working relationship with a founder CEO than I imagine it would be with a corporate CEO because a lot of the times I've taken on a lot of helping with a lot of elements of his personal life to help him concentrate on the business being his business that, you know, I know so much more about him and what's going on and, you know, and you are working quite closely together, you know, when you're building a company, you know, helping them to build the company. And I think if you just want to come to work and do a job and there's nothing wrong with that, you're probably not going to last long term. It's not sustainable to be in a role like this. But if you see this as a career and, you know, there's there's room for both to see, you know, a role as a job or a career, then I think it's going to help you sort of stay there for the long term and be able to weather the lows while you're waiting for the highs. Because there is a lot of up and down when you are working in the startup world and, you know, wondering if your runway is going to last a year and, you know, will your investors keep putting in money and, you know, if the market takes a downturn, how's your company going to handle that? And it's not for everyone. Like it's not always stable and definitely it's not stable in crypto. So you have to be willing to kind of go along for the ride. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well said. And you know, everything you said, it's like, there's just, there's just such a different level of risk, you know, and mm -hmm. different level of risk reward even um, in this type of environment. And it's, yeah, it's, it's funny because it's so similar in that our day-to-day -day tasks and the stuff that we're responsible for does transfer to other roles and other organizations where you don't support a founder. But mm -hmm. it almost feels like to me, in my experience, that the stakes are higher uh, when you're supporting the founder in some ways. Because like you said, it's like, oh, are we going to run out of cash? Are we going to, yes. you know, <laughs> are we going to survive? through the holidays this year and then you get through the holidays and you're like, all right, are we going to survive next year? <laughs> you know? And it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely exhilarating and exhausting. It can be at times. <laughs> yeah. It certainly helps to see whether you've got a strong heart <laughs> mm -hmm. to, to ride out all the, the crazy shocks that can come up, you know, when you're working for a startup. Yeah, Definitely. Well, Janice, thank you so much again for being on the show. Is there is there any kind of final uh, thought or so anything you want to share with Assistance of the World listening as we wrap up? Yeah, of course. I do actually mention this quite a bit when I talk to other EAs and when I've spoken at conferences and that. And I do like to give a, my one piece of advice to other assistants. And I always say, what is the worst they can say? If the answer is no, that is not the worst thing that can happen. You know, I've, I'm, you know, I learned this early in my career and it served me very well, you know, asking for a raise, you know, for a promotion, requesting to join a project. And I have received no's, but I've also received more yeses. And yes, it's scary, but, you know, a lot of times what we're doing, it's not, you know, it's not brain surgery, it's not rocket science. 
And, you know, for every no you get, there will be a yes one day and it will open up doors and provide opportunities. Hmm. Well said. Great way to wrap it up. Uh, is there anywhere that people can reach out to you and, and say hi or other than LinkedIn or is LinkedIn the best spot? Yeah. Yeah, it's mainly LinkedIn, um, okay. you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm on there often. I'm happy to have a chat. You know, if anyone wants to me, DM, ask for advice. Also, always happy to jump on a call. I love networking with other assistants around the world. Love it. Well, I'll put your LinkedIn URL in the show notes, uh, leaderassistant.com slash 224, leaderassistant.com slash 224. Janice, thanks so much again for Thank taking time out of your day to be on the show. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. It's been really enjoyable. Please review on Apple Podcasts. GoBullows.com